There's about 90 rhodiola species, and uh, today we're discussing rhodiola rosea, which has circumpolar distribution. He has a, a proclivity to grow in very high latitude and altitude. It's occurring in 29 countries around the globe. And it grows uh, circumpolar uh, from uh, the Russian Far East, Scandinavia, Greenland. I've even found it on hiking trails in Iceland, all the way to the far northeastern seaboard of Canada. Rhodiola rosea is an extremely slow growing species and the way it is harvested is destructive. So it's, when it's well collected, of course, the entire plant is uprooted because the material of commerce is the subterranean parts, the, the root and the rhizome. Currently, the world supply for rhodiola for the supplement and dietary industry comes from wild harvest from the mountains of Siberia and northern China. Uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Tony Cunningham, and I spent about two years researching um, a handful of rhodiola species. The outcome of that research uh, eventually was summarized in a paper that was published in the Journal of Ethnopharmacology. Uh, and that paper focuses on Rhodiola rosea, which expressed some concerns about the level of, of trade and the conservation status of certain Rhodiola species that are primarily wild collected. And in these places, these plants can be decades old when they are harvested. This is a, again, it's a slow growing plant in the wild. In the wild, it may take uh, 20 to 30 years uh, for populations to reach maturity where where you can collect from a patch or for regeneration from uh, harvested areas. And the demand for rhodiola is growing more and more rapidly than the supply uh, of wild species uh, can actually provide. The fact is in recent years, particularly in the last decade, Illegal collection has been happening more frequently, including in protected areas, uh, particularly near border areas between uh, the Altai region and, the, and Kazakhstan and Xinjiang. In our work and in the uh, paper that summarized our work, we make a strong recommendation for the industry to start making a transition towards supporting sustainable agriculture and sustainable cultivation of rhodiola rosea because there are just too many uncertainties and a lack of transparency to the collection sites for most of the global supply. And here's a plant that needs to be cultivated uh, so that it can survive worldwide. And here's a plant that will actually produce uh, botanical ingredients that are helpful to human health. We are extremely committed to rhodiola rosea. We understand that it is an endangered crop and it is important to be able to grow this in a sustainable nature. I started on a, on a mission to see if somebody like me who really doesn't have a green thumb and doesn't know a lot about agriculture could actually get this plant to grow. So um, it was a bit of a bumpy road at the beginning. Um, I finally reached out to the Alberta Rhodiola Rosea Growers Organization in Canada. People come to us all the time and they say, I want to grow. I love, you know, they're committed. They understand what rhodiola has done for them. And they say, I want to do this. And so we say, yes, that would be great. We would love to have you. And so we have them attend a seminar. We call them new grower seminars. And in those seminars, we tell them everything. New endeavors, there's so much that's not known. We say, this is really how it is. If you'd love to grow with us, this is what you're looking forward to. And this, these barriers to entry, these, the long-term investment, that is all put up front. And so a lot of people do walk away from those seminars and say, yeah, it's really not for me. In the farm uh, setting, um, it takes the plant about five years to grow to maturity. So my next hurdle was to convince farmers to <clears throat> like, trust me, I have no idea how much money you might make out of this because this is all new uncharted territory. Planting the rhodiola 
because I was told that these plants didn't need fertilizer, they didn't need water, they didn't need anything. I just plant them and let them grow and then you make a fortune. And so I planted like 12 acres of the goofy things and uh, they're not growing. Your return on investment will not even start until six years after your first seed is put into the ground. In order to grow, encourage people to grow or the farmers or the hobbyists, think the positive way. It's not the short term. It's just like if I have a thousand dollars or a million dollars you put in an account and investment, you always wait five, 10, 20 years to get your investment. Um, and a few intrepid farmers did just that. And we've now had seven harvests. Since it is such a new crop, there are different ways to do it. And so farmers you will find are actually very inventive people. And so our farmers, we're not telling them this is the way you have to grow. We give them some examples. We're going to guide them. We're gonna support them as much as we can, but we're going to let them decide how it's gonna work for them. We know that people have tried growing this in Oregon, California, and other places, and they have no success at all. And so obviously this is a Northern plant. Um, it's a real tough plant. It likes harsh conditions. Um, and so, you know, it seems to fit. The only, we just gotta, we just gotta find a trick to make it grow well. Every year we're bringing in, I'd say about four new growers and they're serious about doing this. And that's what we're excited about because now we've got enough of that learning curve. You, we want people to walk into this with their eyes wide open and say, this is what you're going to look at, look at it for your efforts. And this is what you're going to look at for your returns as well. Potential of this stuff though is enormous. Uh, market demand for this stuff is huge worldwide. There's money to be made once we figure out how to really make this stuff grow. Why rhodiola? Primarily based on the endangered nature of rhodiola, that this is the one. This is the one that really needs to be addressed and we think we can do it in Alberta. I think it's really important for companies using rhodiola rosea raw materials and extracts to begin to support the initiatives of the conservation oriented and organic certified farms growing rhodiola rosea. Um, they're still relatively small, they still supply a relatively small amount of the global demand, but for that to change, um, they need the uh, commitments and the support from the industry, from the brands, so that they can expand acreage. It takes a long time. It's not apples and apples at all, well-crafted versus cultivated. It's, it's not. It comes down to the customer and what they want and what they need and what their end customer really wants. Do they want something that's sustainable? Do they want something that they can rely on that is always going to be pure it's always going to be a high quality and it's not going to change from year to year. And that's what we offer. And yes, it does cost more. And no, we cannot compete with a well-crafted product. I would love to partner with, with a solid company <clears throat> that has the same sort of um, attitude towards sustainability and freshness and quality. Uh, I would love to partner up with a company that will help us with what they know how to do, which is to promote and market. You know, Russia, they come from Russia. It's cold up there in the mountains. So our lady Petra found out something can grow in Alaska. So why not? Why can't we do it? So we spread them all through Alaska, let them grow everywhere. You know, I'd like to leave this imprint uh, on Alaskan agriculture because I think it can sustain us.